Today we are in our third message in our series in the book of Philippians. We've been talking about Paul's emphasis on happiness. And let me just say this morning that the Bible says that the path to happiness is really through humility. Now we might think this morning, how in the world would humility make me happy? Well, I think there are many reasons why humility is the key that will really unlock our happiness and why pride is the thing that guarantees unhappiness in life. Let me just give you one. One of the greatest killjoys in life, one of the greatest causes of unhappiness is conflict. If you have conflict in your relationships, your life is definitely not going to be a happy one. I got to tell on myself this morning, okay? I went to the Twins game the other night with two of my buddies, and uh, I, I realized when I was leaving the house that it wasn't exactly what my wife wanted me to do. And it kind of spoiled my fun for the evening because I kept thinking about, you know, my wife must have had something else that she wanted me to do today, this evening. Uh, but that, the thing is, when, when you've got conflict, it's just hard to be happy. You know, I was trying to enjoy the Twins game, and in the back of my mind, I keep thinking, well, when I get home, I, uh, I, hope, I hope we're going to be happy. <laughs> and we had, to, uh, we had to take care of that conflict, right? If we're ever going to learn to be happy on a long-term basis, we're going to have to learn how to have reduced conflict in our lives. And that's where humility comes in. The Bible tells us that the habit of humility is the key to reducing conflict in our lives. Because pride is the thing that always causes conflict. Proverbs 13.10 says this, Pride always leads to arguments. Found that out? How many of you would agree with that verse this morning? Pride always leads to conflict, to arguments. Another translation says it this way, only by pride comes contention. Another uh, paraphrase says, pride always leads to arguments. And we're going to look this morning at Philippians chapter 2 and the first 11 verses. Now, I haven't put the scripture verses on the uh, screen this morning uh, just because some, uh, sometimes I'm using some different paraphrases and whatever, but I think we do have, at least you have the NIV to follow along uh, as, we re as we read together. But this passage tells us that the harmony creates happiness. When you live in harmony, you're going to have happiness. We also learn that humility creates that, ha that harmony. And these verses talk about how Jesus modeled those things for us. Let me read this passage, at least from another uh, paraphrase. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. If you're in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Lord, just use your word today to speak to our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul says that God's model for relationships, that God's model for our friendships, for our uh, 
relationships is harmony. And he lists four kinds of harmony. In verse 2, Paul says, Then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one of spirit and of one mind. He says there are four kinds of intimacy that God wants us to have in every true relationship. He wants us to have the same mind. In other words, that's mental harmony, okay? He wants us to be united in our thinking. And he also wants us to have the same love. That's emotional harmony. He wants us to be in harmony emotionally. He wants us to be united in spirit. That's spiritual harmony. And he says he wants us to be intent on one purpose. That's directional harmony. In other words, we need to be headed in the same direction. Today we're going to look at how to reduce conflict with others. How many could use a little bit of that? Uh, I'll raise my hand, all right? How to reduce conflict with others. How to have harmony and how to have more happiness in our relationships. First, let me say that this will be 100% radically countercultural. It's the exact opposite of everything that we've been taught by the world around us. Our culture teaches that the exact opposite of what the Bible says about relationships. If I were to ask you this morning to name five strong marriages, could you do that? If I were to say, okay, name, don't just say, yeah, I can do it, but name five strong marriages that you know of, would we have a hard time doing that? The kind of marriages that have mental, uh, emotional, spiritual, and directional harmony. The fact is, we aren't very good at relationships all the time. And the reason is because we don't follow what God tells us to do. Secondly, what we're going to talk about isn't natural. It's countercultural, and it's not natural. It doesn't always just feel like the right thing. But it is the right thing to do. And then third, I would warn you that this week you're going to be tested in these things. In your relationships, you're going to be tested. God is going to give you the opportunity to practice these four habits that we're going to talk about of humble happiness. So let's get into it. The first of these four habits that I want to share today for reducing conflict in our life is this. Never let your pride be your guide. Never let your pride be your guide. Why? You say, well, why, why is that? Because pride is the root of every other relational sin that we have. Every conflict that we go through has an element of pride mixed in it. In other words, we have an eye problem. Not an eye problem, but an eye problem, okay? I want what I want when I want it. And that causes all kinds of problems in relationships. Not letting pride be our guide is totally count, counter culture this, this morning. Philippians 2.3 says this, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Do you realize how hard it is to keep that verse? Do you realize how hard it is to be obedient to that verse? Not doing anything out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Those are two conflict-creating kinds of pride. Selfish ambition is saying simply, it's all about me. It's all about me. Vain conceit means I'm always right. James chapter 3 and verse 16 says this, Whenever there is jealousy or selfish ambition, you will find confusion and every other kind of evil. Boy, I say amen to that. Whenever you find confusion, whether it's in our workplace, whether it's in our office, our home, our school, you can know that selfish ambition and jealousy are behind it. It's the attitude of, if you won't play ball with me the way I want, I'll take my ball and go home. It's all about me. It's selfish ambition. Vain conceit is the attitude that says, I'm always right. 
I'm always right. The, the Living Bible version of this verse says, don't live to make a good impression on others. The, today's English version says this, don't do anything from a cheap desire to boast. You know, there's a huge temptation in that today. On the internet, social media, to make ourselves look better than we really are. You know, we, what, what things do we post we don't post the, the junk that's going on in our lives, do we? We don't, po we don't post the, the difficulties that we're struggling with, more than likely. Most often, we struggle with all the good things, the fun things that, that are happening in our lives. But it's not only the Internet. We're tempted to do that in all kinds of areas of our lives. In Galatians, another one of Paul's letters, he lists about 17 effects of living with pride. He calls it works of the flesh. He says when we live that self-centered, self-indulgent life, it shows up in all kinds of avenues, in all kinds of ways in our life. He talks about self-indulgence showing up in sexual immorality, in wild partying, and getting in drunk. You, you know, you might expect those things. But most of the things on his list are actually sins that you and I have to deal with every day. You say, well, you may say, well, I don't have a problem with sexual immorality or partying or getting drunk, but I guarantee you, you have issues with some of these things that Paul talks about, because I know I do. I'm a human. These everyday rela relational sins. Here's what he says in chapter 5 of Galatians, verses 19 through 20. He says, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, I love that word. It's an awful word, but it's a, it just kind of rolls off your tongue nice. Idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. I don't know about you, but that kind of is sobering to me. Paul is saying that if we're going to have happiness, we've got to have harmony. And if you're going to have harmony, you've got to have humility. All right, the second habit, I think, is just kind of the flip side. It's another way of saying the same thing, but it's saying, be humble or you'll stumble. Be humble or you'll stumble. There was a, a pastor that I knew that uh, just... Things were just going great for them. Their church was just exploding. Things are just going great. And my prayer for him going into that was, Lord, help him to stay humble. And I'm, I didn't pray, Lord, humble him. But I said, Lord, help him to stay humble. Uh, unfortunately, there were some problems that came up, and there was a problem with humility. Uh, I just think that, one of the most important things in our lives as Christians is always stay humble. Be humble or you're going to stumble. And if we're not humble, our relationships are going to crumble, aren't they? Humility is the basis and it's the foundation of every great marriage. It's a foundation of every great relationship. Because in humility, you don't act like you know it all. It's a matter of, it's, it's really a matter of trying to outdo each other in honor, honoring one another. In verse 3 of Philippians 2, our text says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Again, that's the, that's the very opposite of what our culture teaches us. Our culture, te culture teaches us that we've got to do what's best for me. You've got to do what's best for, for yourself. I've got to look out for number one. That's what culture says. I've got to do what makes me happy. But Paul comes along and Paul says, no, you need to be humble and give more honor to others than yourself. Humility is probably the most misunderstood quality, I think, that we need in our lives. A lot of people think it means that we go around saying, oh, I'm no good, you know. I can't do anything right, you know, or poor me and woe is me. You know what, that, that's false humility. 
That's what we're trying to get others to, to tell us how good we are. Oh, no, no, you're just good. You're fine. That's false humility. That's degrading ourselves. Humility is not thinking less of myself. Humility is thinking of myself less. And humility is thinking about other people more. Other people first. Humility really has nothing to do with what I'm thinking of myself. Humility is what I'm thinking of other people. That's what humility is. Someone has said, great people make people feel great. Little people be little people. How true. Paul says, he says, instead be humble and give more honor to others than yourself. Humility is not devaluing myself. It's valuing others more. It's not denying my strengths, okay? But it's being honest about my weaknesses is really what it is. James 4, 6 says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. God actually hates pride, and he'll oppose that. God gives grace to the humble. Grace, I think, is the ability to forgive when I don't feel like forgiving. It's the ability to resolve a conflict when I don't feel like resolving a conflict. I was hoping not for a conflict when I came home from the Twins game. But it's the ability to compromise, to sit down and talk things out. It's the ability to get along. The only way our relationships are going to last, folks, is because of grace. God gives us grace. We need to give others that grace. The only way we get God's grace is by being humble. All right, the third habit for overcoming conflict this is a very practical one. It's learning the lost art of paying attention. We live in an ADD world, you know that? We live in an attention deficit disorder world. Everybody's got it to some degree. And it's because our technology has trained us to no longer pay attention to people around us. We pay attention to screens more than we do to pay attention to people. Don't you just hate it? When you're trying to talk to somebody and they're looking at their phone, you know? Yeah, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. You, you, I just want to say, you know, throw that thing away. Look at me. I love what little kids do. You know what little kids do with mom? When they're trying to get mom's attention and mom's attention is somewhere else, what do they do? They take your face and they go. <laughs> Isn't it exactly? They want you to look them in the eye. They're telling you something. We need to pay attention. Social media can get us distracted from seeing the people around us, the people in our lives. How many people do you walk by every day? And you've lost the art of paying attention. I get a kick out. I go walking. I like to walk. I walk four miles usually, uh, most every day. And uh, I run into people. And I just get a kick out of how some, you know, some will walk by you like this. You know, or some are looking around. Or some have their ear, earphones on. So it doesn't, you know, if you say hi, they don't hear you anyhow. But I just love to just smile, say hi, and see how, what the reaction is. We've lost the art of paying attention because it's, it's all about us. It's all about our agenda. If we're going to be humble, we've got to learn that lost art of paying attention. Verse 4, Paul says, Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. We need to be interested in what other people are interested in. Parents, I would ask you the question this morning. You need to be careful, I say, you need to be careful to not just be interested in what you want your kids to be interested in. You need to be interested in what your kids are interested in. Now, my dad was a great dad. My mom, mom, dad, I love him to death. But one thing that I learned from them that I wanted to be different. My parents weren't into sports at all. And that's kind of part of the generation, I think, whatever, but... Uh, they didn't come. To, I, I love sports and I played sports, and they didn't come to a lot of my games and stuff. And I always wish they had, uh, because that was part of what I really enjoyed. I had a friend of mine that his parents came to everything, 
If we had a home baseball game or an away baseball game or a home basketball game or away basketball game, they came to everything. And I just, I thought that was so cool. And I want, that's what I wanted to do as a parent. And I did. I did a lot of coaching. I sat on a lot of benches and I sat on a lot of, a lot of uh, gym, uh, whatever they call those things. Not, bleachers, that's what they call them. Not saying that I'm, I was a better dad than my dad, but that was one thing that I learned, uh, a negative thing from my parents that I thought, you know, I, I want to be a little, I want to be different from that. My parents did a lot of great, wonderful things, and one thing they did was raise us as Christians, the best thing in the world. Uh, we need to be interested in what other people are interested in. There's a word for that, folks. It's called love. Just loving people. Another word for it's humility. How about it this morning? Are you really interested in what your spouse is saying? If you go to a twins game and you maybe should have stayed home, you better listen to what your spouse is saying. Are you really interested in what your kids say? Unfortunately, that doesn't come naturally for us. By nature, we're interested in what we're interested in, not in what other people are interested in. By nature, we think of ourselves more than we think about somebody else. Harmony comes when we are interested in what other people are interested in and we are caring about what other people care about. Here's a question for you this morning. Do you find people or do you find yourself being bored when you talk to people and they're talking about things that you're not interested in? Do you find yourself getting a little bored? Are you thinking, you know, just get me out of here? Do you often find your attention drifting when someone is talking to you? Or are you one of those persons that while someone is talking to you, you're not really listening to them, but you're thinking about how you're going to respond to them? You need to learn the lost art of paying attention. It's an act of love. The greatest gift that we can give someone is our attention. When I look you in the eye, it's saying to you that you matter. I care about what you're saying. You know that it's possible to listen without paying attention? Your mind can be a million miles away. My wife tells me that she's told me some things in the past, you know, that, you know, and, and I say, man, I don't, I don't remember that. I just don't remember you saying that. Well, what was the problem? Probably I wasn't paying attention. I'm a terrible husband, I tell you. <laughs> but our mind can be a million miles away. That's not really listening. And it's certainly not paying attention. All right, number four. Fourth thing we need to ask, what would Jesus do? Now, I know that may sound like an old cliche. Maybe some of you still have the wristband thing that you wear. What would Jesus do? It may be old, but it's still true, folks. And it comes from verse 5. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. What would Jesus do? We need to learn to ask that question, I think, over and over and over again. And we'll always come up with a humble answer. We'll always come up with a humble answer. The answer that builds harmony, that builds happiness, rather than leads to difficulty and defeat and bitterness and conflict and resentment. So, real briefly here, acting like Jesus, I think, means three things. Number one, it means I don't demand what I think I deserve. We, we live in a culture that, you know, we, th we have all these rights. We want all of our rights, and we deserve these things. Verses 6 and 7, Paul says, who, you're talking about Jesus, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. Just think about that. Even though he was God, he didn't demand his rights. Now that's totally countercultural today. We were brought up with the idea that we've got all these rights. But folks, having rights doesn't mean that we are always to demand those rights. Demanding just makes people more resistant to us. It makes them more 
retaliatory, if you will, towards us. Jesus, though Jesus was man, it says he did not demand and cling to his rights as God. I don't think we're ever going to get what we want or what we need by demanding our rights. We can be understanding without being demanding. We can get our needs met without blowing people away. We can do it by being nice. Well, we just need a whole bunch of doses of niceness in our uh, society today. How about it this morning? Are you understanding? In your relationships, or are you demanding? If I want to be like Jesus, I don't demand what I think I deserve always. And then the second thing, acting like Jesus means that I look for ways that I can serve. I look for ways that I can serve. Verse 7 of Philippians chapter 2 tells us that Jesus took on the nature of a servant, becoming a human just like us. I think if we want to be like Jesus, folks, we're going to have to learn to be a servant. Again, that's the exact opposite of our culture. Our culture says our whole goal in life is to get other people to serve us. The more people that we have serving us, the more important we are. You know what? The scripture turns that totally around, doesn't it? That, the world says the more people we have serving us, the more important we are. But God's value system is the exact opposite. God's value system says the more people you serve, the more important you are. The more you give your life away, the more God blesses you with honor. In other words, God says the way up is down. He says on, before honor is humility. And if you want to be great, learn to be the servant of all. This is a habit, folks, that we can develop in our lives. And we'll be more likely to develop this habit, I think, in the little things of life rather than in the big things. I think God tests our humility every single day of our lives. It's very true that character can be, re can be revealed in the big crisis of life. But it's built in the little day-to-day -day things. You know, like returning the grocery cart to the cart rack. I won't say any more. All right, and then the third thing, acting like Jesus means I always do what's right even when it's painful. We were youth pastors. And the, the last place we were youth pastors, we uh, loved it there. Just uh, I love I could have stayed there a long time. But uh, there was a, a, a kind of a, a conflict developed. I didn't do anything wrong. And that's, I'm not just saying that, but I didn't do anything wrong. But the pastor, at, after we had had a conversation, called me in the next day and said, uh, I think it's time for you to look for someplace else. And I, I mean, I was kind of devastated. Uh, my wife was too, and we were wondering, you know, what are we going to do now? God took care of us. It wasn't a problem. But if you know anything about youth pastors, they can become kind of the church darling. Uh, and, and the people in the church loved us. We had a great youth group. Things were going really good. We knew that if we handle that situation wrong, we could blow that church up. If we can, you know, get everybody on our side, you know, look at the pastor did this. We knew that if we didn't do things right, we could cause a lot of problems. We knew we had to do the right thing. We left the church. We didn't say anything to anybody. And, you know, long story short, I mean, God obviously had led us in another direction. We were able to go up to northern Wisconsin, started a church, stayed there for 38 years had a wonderful uh, experience. But the reason I, I say that is not to pat myself on the back, but to say it's always right to do the right thing. You know, it would been it would been felt really good if we would have got a whole bunch of people on our side and said, hey, you know, what's going on here, and make you feel good. But it's not the right thing to do. Um, I got to share with a staff the other a couple weeks ago. One of the, there's a church, they've got several churches, satellite churches, whatever, and the pastor asked if I'd just come and share with his staff uh, about life experiences and whatever. And I shared with them about that experience because I said to them, you know, it's always right to do the right thing. 
You've got to, if you're going to be Christ-like, what would Jesus do? Jesus wouldn't want to cause confusion and division and whatever. So it means I always do right, even when it's painful. That was a painful experience. But you know what? We made it through it, and God had something for us. Verse 8, Paul says, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And because Jesus was the greatest example of humility, God has given him the greatest honor in the universe. Think about that. The last couple of these verses says this, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Because he was humbled himself, God honored him. You know what, folks? One day even atheists are going to acknowledge the truth. Every knee is going to bow, and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You know, when people come to you today, and they say, well, what in the world is this world coming to? You know what? You can say this. Well, one day every knee is going to bow, and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is who he said he was, that he is the Son of God. That he is Lord. I don't know about you, but I want to acknowledge that willfully now rather than having to acknowledge it later on. Amen? I wonder this morning, how are you doing in these habits of reducing conflict in your lives? Maybe some of you are saying, well, I don't feel like I've got any conflict in my life. Well, praise God. That's great. But there's a day coming. For all of us, because we all struggle, we all go through these things.